Thank you. So yes, I'll be talking about uh, decidable reasoning about distributed protocols, and this is joint work with Juliana Losa, Muli Sagir, and Sharon Sharon. So first I want to say a little bit about why uh, verified distributed systems and distributed protocols, and they're really, I think the last talk gave a very good context that it's becoming more and more uh, ubiquitous, and we depend on it. Uh, our dependence on distributed systems is uh, increasing, uh, uh, is constantly increasing. And also the distributed systems are really hard to get right. They have all sorts of bugs that occur in rare cases and, and uh, rare scenarios, and really testing is not sufficient. We would really like to have formal verification uh, for distributed protocols. So this talk is mostly about Paxos. I want to tell you a little bit, for those of you who don't know, Paxos is, at its simplest uh, uh, form, it's a consensus uh, protocol that lets nodes agree on a single value. And it can also uh, be used for state machine replication, which is uh, the, the most common approach for strong consistency. So unlike what you heard about in the last session, and I think unlike some of the things you'll hear in the next session, in the next talk, but uh, Paxos lets you attain strong consistency. So that the nodes, if you have a replicated state machine, all the nodes are guaranteed to be in the same state. And it's really a pervasive approach to obtain fault-tolerant uh, distributed uh, computing. It's used by, uh, by uh, re really everyone that has distributed systems. And there has also been some recent success stories from the verification community uh, to verify Paxos and variants of Paxos. So two uh, examples are Ironfleet and Verdi. Ar Ironfleet verified an implementation of multi-Paxos in Daphne, and Verdi verified an implementation of Raft in Coq. And what's nice about these, uh, these, uh, these works is that they actually succeeded in verifying a, a real-world system. What feels like there is still room for improvement is the great effort that was required to, to, to achieve this. And you see here some numbers from the papers. And our overall goal with, with this line of work is to reduce the human effort that's needed to verify distributed protocols, but maintain the flexibility and the richness of, and the complexity of the systems that we can verify and the properties that we can verify. So I want to briefly state our contribution, and then I'll, I'll dive into, uh, into the different parts. So we develop a methodology for decidable verification of distributed systems. And this methodology is, is basically composed of two steps. The first step is that uh, you express your protocol in first order logic. You start with some abstract description of the protocol, maybe from a distributed uh, uh, a computing paper, or maybe you're building a system and you have the design of the protocol in your mind, and you model it in first order logic. Now, this involves some abstraction, as, as we'll see later. And at this point, it's already useful because you can apply some, uh, some automated theorem proofers for first order logic to start checking things about your protocol, but it all involves undecidable reasoning. And with this work, we really want to bring it down to decidable reasoning, so we introduce this second step of systematically transforming your, your first order logic specification to a, decidable, uh, to a specification that is amenable to decidable verification with decidable verification conditions. And then we can actually use automated solvers and get predictable and reliable automation to verify uh, uh, these protocols. And the overall uh, effect of this methodology is that you can get predictable automation and get mechanic verification with less human effort. And the decidable fragment that we use is EPR. This exists for our fragment. And I'll say a little bit more about it uh, later. So the, the protocols that we verified with this work are all kinds of variants of Paxos. You see that for some of them, we actually obtained the first uh, mechanic verification. And I'll elaborate on those numbers uh, uh, later in the talk. OK, so let me now explain the first state, state, stage of the methodology. How, what do we mean by modeling uh, the protocol in first order logic? So we model the state of the protocol as a first order structure, which you can think of as basically a database with several tables. And the way we, we express the state of the protocol is, for example, we have some, uh, some relation that uh, captures uh, joint messages in the, in the network. So you don't need to know the details of Paxos to, to understand this slide, but just Paxos has messages where a node jo joins around and report some round and value, so we capture that with a relation. Similarly, we capture a decision that's been made for in some round for some value by a relation. The second thing you have to do is you have to express the actions of the protocols of the protocol as updates 
to this relation. So here's an example for what it looks like uh, uh, in our modeling language. So we have a kind of imperative style modeling language that lets you update relations. So when a join, when a node joins a round, this action can only happen if this round was started, if it had a start message. It computes our values and then it sends a join message which we model by inserting a tuple into a relation. The next thing you have to do to verify your protocol is to express both your safety properties. Say you want to verify a safety property like the consistency of decisions, that every two decisions uh, are on, on, agree on the value that is being decided. So you have to express your safety property as a first order formula. And you also have to express your inductive invariant in first order logic. And an important point to note here is that we are using quantifiers to quantify over nodes or rounds and values. And all of these quantifiers are unbounded. We're interested to verify these protocols for an unbounded number of nodes, messages, values, uh, you name it. And after you do all of this, you can actually get verification conditions in first order logic. But this, te this step that I just described, if you want to apply to Paxos, it's not even clear at first, uh, the first time you think of it that it's possible to do it. Because Paxos and many consensus algorithms have preconditions like you have to, you wait, before you do some action, you wait to hear for, for a message, you, you wait to hear some kind of message from a majority of the nodes, more than half of the nodes. And at least uh, on the surface, it seems that you need set cardinalities and set quantifiers and arithmetic to model all of that. But really the insight that lets us uh, uh, get this down to first order logic is that the set cardinalities are only used to get a simple effect. You only, the, the effect that you really want is you want to use these quorums uh, or that model majority sets, and you just want to say that every two quorums intersect. So you can express this in first order logic with a sort for quorums, a membership relation, and then this axiom that says that for every two quorums there exists a node that is a member of both of them. And this lets you express this uh, action uh, by, by this formula. So you see, instead of requiring more than half uh, join messages more than n over 2 join messages we require that there exists a quorum such that for every node in this quorum this node sent a join message which is expressed with another existential quantifier for the other fields of the message and this is really a principle that you have to apply several times so we we uh, model quor we model quorums with these axioms the round in paxos are natural numbers and many protocols use natural numbers but we, we can abstract them by just uh, to axioms for a total order. And similarly, we can uh, represent messages by just relations. And this, all of these uh, things involve some abstraction. So you take your, some, some knowledge that you have about the protocol and you abstract it in a meaningful way in first order logic that still captures the correctness of the protocol. And after you do this, you can uh, write to yourself a, a model of Paxos in first order logic. You can also write your invariant in first order logic, and then you can get verification conditions that are in first order logic. But still, uh, if you give them to some automated server, it could succeed if you're lucky, but it could also diverge because it's still an undecidable problem. So our, our next step is to really dive into this undecidability and try to eliminate it and get to a decidable, uh, to a decidable fragment. And now I'll show you how we do this. So really, the, the source of, uh, of undecidability in first order logic is quantifier alternation cycles. And I'll show you what I, what I mean by that. So you remember this axiom that every two quorums there, for every two quorums there exists a node that is a member of both of them. This is one important part of the protocol. Another important part is this precondition that you wait for a quorum such that all nodes in this quorum send a message. And another important part of the inductive environment, as you can imagine, is that for every decision, there exists a quorum such that all nodes in this uh, quorum voted for this decision. <coughs> and now let's look more closely at the quantifier structure of this formula. So I'm drawing here a graph that we call the quantifier alternation graph, where the nodes are, are sorts in, in our vocabulary. And I'm going to draw an edge whenever between two sorts, whenever we have a for all exists quantifier alternation between them. So from the first uh, formula here, we get an edge from quorums to nodes, because for every quorum, the, for every two quorums, there exists a node. From the second uh, formula, I'm going to draw an edge from nodes to rounds and values, because every node, there exists a round and a value. 
And from the last formula, we get edges from rounds and values to quorums. And here you see that we got a, a cycle in this graph. And this really quickly leads to both undecidability and practical divergence of solvers, because if they instantiate the quantifiers, then for every quorum there is a node, for every node there is a round, for every round there is a quorum, and you can keep going like this forever. So our uh, solution for this is to now eliminate these cycles. And the key idea in doing this is to define derived relations and use them to rewrite both the system and the invariant. So one example of this, and I should stress that this is done by the user. So the, the user examines this quantified alternation graph and decides how to, how to eliminate the cycles. So we, we detect this, so you see this uh, existential subformula, and we can define a new derived relations, a new derived relation that's meant to capture the meaning of this formula, but we cannot really expose this equivalence to the underlying solver. This would bring us back to the undecidability. Instead, we, whenever we update this relation, we add update code to maintain this equivalence. So this update code, we can derive it automatically, but just the, the creative part of identifying this formula and defining this relation, we, we have to use uh, to rely on user judgment for this. And after uh, we, we define this relation, we can rewrite this action condition to this formula, and you see that we have eliminated this quantifier alternation, so we have eliminated some edges from the quantifier alternation graph. And with another derived relation that I won't get into, we, we actually are able to get this graph to be acyclic, which means that now the verification conditions are decidable to check. And it turns out, at least for Paxos, that this is not quite enough because we, get a, a, we still get a counterexample. And the reason we get a counterexample is really that the solver is unaware of this equivalence. But there is still a way, uh, a way to, to solve this and to have the verification work. And this way is to let the user do local rewrites, local changes in the, uh, in the model that, uh, that uh, uh, replace, instead of having the solver being aware of this equivalence, we just do this rewrite. Now, of course, ideally, we also want to verify that this rewrite is sound. And to do that, we really want to verify that this triangle and this circle are equivalent. Now, this must, it uh, could not be true in general, but at least it should be true for the reachable states of the protocol. And we actually uh, allow the user to take advantage of this by defining some auxiliary environment that implies this, uh, this equivalence and also checking that the, the original model satisfies this environment. Now, it's actually the case that because this auxiliary invariant is simpler than the full invariant that you need for correctness, you can get both of these checks to be in, in the decidable fragment. So the overall picture of the, of the second stage is that the user uh, ex uh, examines this quantifier alternation graph and then uh, exercises some judgment and to define derived relation and rewrites but uh, to, to reduce the verification to decidable problems. And really, the soundness of all of these transformations can be checked in the decidable fragment. And I also want to, just to, to give you a flavor of the, the way, the shape of these invariants. So using first order logic and using this decidable fragment, I personally think it's really nice because the invariants are human readable and friendly and not so obscure. Okay, so now I want to uh, describe a little bit more our, our evaluation. So you see here a few variants of Paxos uh, uh, that we verified. As I mentioned, for some of them, it is the first uh, mechanized proof. And what's really nice is that the transformations to EPR, these uh, judgments that the user has to make about which derived relations to add and which rewrites to do, these were completely reusable across all of these variants. The next thing I want you to pay attention to is the, the number of conjectures, which is roughly the number of lines we had to, to write to verify every model, and how, how this compares to, to current state of the art. So I think that really it, you, you can see that we, we got much less, uh, uh, a, a much better ratio between the proof and the model. And this really comes from the fact that, that so much more is automated because we are sending these formulas to to an SMT solver that we know it will terminate because we're in this decidable fragment. So now let's let, take a look at the runtime. So the solver does have some randomness. So we repeated the, this experiment 10 times. And you see here 
the mean and the standard deviation of the time to verify the invariance in EPL and also the the verification time it took to verify the soundness of the transformations and this really had no uh, no deviation at all and you see that it's very reasonable it's a few seconds for every protocol and to really uh, see the value of this uh, transformation to the decidable fragment I want to contrast this with say you took the original first order logic model and you made it you made the server terminate by just bounding the number of rounds that the protocol can take and you see here that the verification time and also the standard deviation quickly increases as the number of rounds increases. This is for multipaxos, which is the simplest one of all of these variants. And also here we use the timeout of, of uh, 300 seconds, five minutes. You see that we're starting to get timeouts. For stoppable paxos, really, the minute you go to four rounds, you, we, we got the, these, uh, these timeouts. And I, I really like this, uh, the fact that we... Uh, managed to verify stoppable paxos. I don't know how many people in the room know this protocol, but it's really, for me, it's the highest mountain in the paxos landscape. Even the, the original paper uh, said that it's, uh, it wasn't easy to get the details right. And the original paper actually included eight, eight pages of like Lampert style hierarchical proof that this protocol is correct. And we've been able to replace these eight pages by 16 conjectures that are completely mechanically checked. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's really nice. And okay, I think I'll, I'll wrap up. So we develop a methodology for decidable verification of infinite state systems that uh, basically com comprises of two steps. The first is that you abstract your protocol in first order logic. And the second is that you systematically transform it to, uh, to a decidable fragment. And then you can completely automate the rest of the verification work. Uh, so th the benefits of reducing to this decidable fragment is both that you get predictable automation, the server is guaranteed to terminate, and also whenever the verification fails, you get a finite counterexample that you can present to the user. And we have been able to apply to uh, an interesting class of, uh, of protocols, and, and including this topical process that I really like. Uh, I want to mention a few future directions, or very near future directions of this work. So one of them is applying these techniques and uh, developing a way to, to also prove liveness and temporal properties. And you can hear about that in, uh, in Popper in January. And another nice thing that came out of this work is that even if you just use the first step of, uh, of, uh, of the abstracting things in first order logic, you can actually use it in an interactive theorem prover. And, uh, and Giuliano Rosa, my co-author, uh, used it to reduce some proofs of the Ethereum project from, uh, you see, 1,600 lines to four, 470 lines, and it actually got, the pull request got pulled into the Ethereum project, and now they're using this style of proof to prove their protocols. So that's it. Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take questions.